First, on digital devices and digital worlds between infrastructure and experience. We will hear the senior lecturer in ethnology at Lund University and artist Robert Willem. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Just something to drink here. Just in case. So, digital devices and digital worlds. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to take the perspective today to start with the user. We haven't heard so much about the users today. We heard a lot about policies and about technologies and so on and the development of technologies. So the users, when I say we, it's you and me. I'm going to start with uh, the things that reside between experiences of using digital tools and devices and infrastructure, namely imaginaries. How imaginaries emerge uh, among users of technologies. And I'm going to re relate it both to sort of mundane situations where people use technologies and uh, to uh, ideas about ungraspable infrastructures. Let's move back to a point in time, a little bit more than 10 years ago. 2006, this was a time when people could be fascinated of being a small moving dot on a screen. This was a time when the GPS receiver started to be uh, uh, more widespread. It was a time before uh, GPS receivers were uh, part of more uh, smartphones, but you could have this kind of handheld GPS receiver. And I did some research about users of these kind of technologies, and I looked at the ways they uh, thought about the technology and how they, uh, how they imagined this uh, technology that was quite new that, at that time. And what many said that was that they were fascinated of seeing representations of themselves on the screen. You could have a map on the small screen, and you could walk around in the landscape and see this small dot move around on the screen. And it was a fascinating experience of many. After some years, it wasn't that fascinating anymore. And I'm quite intrigued by this, how that, that kind of fascination wears off. Why does it disappear? Why isn't it fascinating anymore? Why does it become part of routinized everyday life? I use the term mundanization to understand this kind of uh, development of technology. How immensely complex digital systems are turned into mundane uh, everyday life. Think about the GPS. In order to make it work, you need almost 30 satellites orbiting the Earth, an enormous industrial corporate complex of infrastructures and diff different stakeholders, and still we just use it in everyday life and don't think so much about it. It has become mundanized. It has become part of this part of reality that we all live inside. This sort of, sort of bubble uh, that is surrounding us, and to some extent that are sheltering us from thinking too much about what is really hiding behind everything uh, we use in our everyday lives. And it's also maybe connected to the kind of uh, ignorance that Lawrence Lessig talked about uh, yesterday, how we can become ignorant towards quite many uh, complex systems because we, we don't think about them all the time. Uh, and if we move from 2006 back to another point in time, namely to this year, what do we have around us that we still can be fascinating about today? The GPS is not that much a, a, a device for fascination. One thing, I think, that, is, uh, that has the same kind of status as the GPS receiver had uh, in 2006, that is voice-controlled home assistants. These are starting to become um, more widespread today. Uh, a number of stakeholders are promoting this. Uh, Apple have Siri. Cortana uh, is uh, Microsoft's uh, home assistant. Alexa from Amazon and so on. Uh, 
many of you have Siri in your uh, smartphones. But the question is, when you interact with these voices, whose voice do you interact with? There are examples of quite many users verbally abusing their uh, often female assistants. You can think about this. Why the, do they have many producers chosen female names to this? There's a gender issue to this. And what happens when people abuse them, sometimes sexually? Uh, they answer in often polite, poli polite ways. But who is answering? It's not Siri that answers. It's not Alexa, or it's not Cortana. Or it maybe is Siri, Alexa, or Cortana. But who are they really? Are they independent entities? No, they are part of extremely complex corporate infrastructures. Programmers have decided what they would, uh, what these home assistants uh, are going to say, answer. And these um, uh, ungraspable technological systems, users have to imagine. And at this time, you maybe think, uh, uh, whose voice is it? Who do I, re do I really talk uh, with? And how do I imagine what is happening beyond, not just the screen in this case, but beyond this kind of voice that I'm talking with in quite maybe intimate settings, like in a home setting, in a domestic setting. It's one of the most intimate spheres we have. We maybe talk to an electronic device that is interconnected to technological systems that are often ungraspable. And how are these then related to how imaginaries of infrastructure and industry uh, emerge? If we look at the way, some way that uh, recent uh, um, uh, that um, corporations recently has uh, st chosen to visualize their infrastructure, we often see these kind of images. This is from the uh, Swedish um, uh, internet service provider Bahnhof. Uh, this is another picture from the same company from their uh, quite famous data center called Pionen in Stockholm. It's in a so former civil defense bunker. And the interesting thing is. These pictures, pictures instill some kind of fascination. And if you think about Siri, Cortana, and, uh, uh, and Alexa in one end of, the sort of, um, uh, uh, of this system, you have this in the other uh, end. These kind of systems that we, are, we don't know very much about, but we, we can become fascinated by looking at the infrastructures, how they look, and so on, and how they are um, imagined. And I could relate that to uh, some research I've done re during the last years about the ways that industries are aestheticized. How are industries um, turned into something that it can be aesthetically pleasing and something that, it's, uh, that corporations choose as part of their brandscapes in order to promote themselves? You can see, for example, that um, uh, companies like Bahnhof had this uh, kind of... Um, cooling of their, uh, the images of their infrastructures. Google did the same thing. 2012, they started their transparency campaign. Many of you have probably seen images from the data centers and so on, where they tried to instill some kind of trust and idea that we are not just a cloud service pro provided that uh, are providing services in this ephemeral cloud. We are a serious industrial business. And these are our uh, um, infrastructures. And often, you can see this kind of aesthetics used, where you, a kind of calmness, uh, you can see it, it gives an impre impression of precision. At the same time, you can see uh, that it's um, something that is uh, calmly giving you impression of things just work. You can trust us. Things will work. And if you look at this kind of um, aesthetics, you can see that industries did this hundreds of years ago. Hundreds of years ago, when industries and corporations should uh, make aesthetically pleasing, uh, pleasing images of themselves, they often use this kind of long rows of, not servers in that case, but machinery that sort of just disappear into the horizon. And it could give this kind of idea of something cool and something that is uh, just working, and that you can relax uh, when you use it. On the other hand, it can also be connected to another kind of aesthetics. It's something that um, the uh, historian of technology, David E. Nye, calls the technological or industrial sublime. 
and he looked at the way that uh, technologies and industries has been uh, visualized during the last hundred years, especially in the, in the U.S., and how they often be, was connected to being something unfathomable and almost frightening power, magnitude, or complexity. He talks about the mathematical uh, complexity that is so, you just understand that it's something so complex that we can ne never really understand. And you often hear that kind of a discussion when it comes to the internet today and the infrastructures of the internet. And I want to think about, uh, I want us to think about this extreme complexity that is almost sublime and uh, almost frightening and how that can be related to the idea about mundanization. And how the ungraspable is always hiding beyond the mundane in the everyday use of technologies. And when the ungraspable is hiding beyond the mundane, we can think about our everyday life as mundania. We all live in mundania, this life that is sort of sheltered from this extreme, ungraspable, sometimes frightening complexity. But the question then is, how can we look into this? How can we look beyond into this infrastructure? How can we look beyond mundania? How can we reach beyond this uh, shelter we have around us? When does, the, when does cracks appear in the walls of this realm of routinized everyday life? Possibly it is at the times when we are fascinated with new technologies. It's just a wind, short window of opportunity that I want us to, us to grab and really think about when we become thrilled by a new technology, that might be the time when the light gets in, when the light gets into mundane, and when we really have the possibility to see something, what happens beyond. And that might also be a very good point as a researcher to look on uses, start talking with people about, for example, voice control, home assistance, or like 10 years ago about GPS. Today, when you talk about GPS, it's People say, yeah, I use it when I go to work, and uh, I use uh, some, uh, yeah, look for where the kids are, and so I have this uh, friend finder. On, uh, and, but when it's just, it's about to uh, appear on the, uh, it, it's, that might be the time when uh, we really should study it to learn how the ungraspable is connected to the mundane. So when you're thrilled to, or when you were thrilled to be a small moving dot on a screen, when you wonder who you really are speaking with through your electronic device, that might be the time that you really should think about what is digital devices and what, what are the digital worlds that we all the time are connected to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I'd like to meet that with another question. You said, do people know who they're talking to? And probably the answer is no, they don't. Mm. Um, why does it matter? I think it matters for reasons that we have been talking about these last two days. Uh, everything from Lawrence Lessig's ideas about democracy to ideas about privacy and integrity. And to really know that, for, for example, if you insult this voice. Why do you do that? Uh, is it because uh, you feel that it's a subservient being? And if you start thinking about, okay, it is not a subservient being, it is part of a powerful corporate infrastructure, would that change your behavior? Um, that's one reason. And also, it's a way for us to um, really start critically assessing what is uh, hiding beyond our everyday life, uh, our everyday uh, interfaces. Thank you. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. We continue with the headline, digitizing of our physical environment, cognitive visual systems in animals, humans, and computers. And we meet prof the professor at the Center for Mathematical Studies at Lund University, Kalle Åström. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about, I come from the Center for Mathematical Sciences, and I'm a professor there, and I do research on computer vision and machine learning. So I'm basically going to talk about two, two themes. One is how we extract information in terms of 3D and 3D understanding. And the second theme is in terms of machine learning and recognition for images. 
But first, before we begin, I just want to say that I, we come from the math department, and we belong both to the science faculty and the engineering faculty. And we do research within math, mathematical statistics, and numerical analysis. So there's a whole range of research done at the department. And we have a computer vision group that uh, belong, and we are about 20, 25 people doing machine learning and computer vision. So what is it really that we, we do? Well, we're trying to extract meaningful information from images. So images are, in a sense, already digital. We would take digital images. They are already represented as lots and lots of numbers. So here, all of these numbers represent what we call a picture element or a pixel. And a low number, say zero, means dark. And a high number, uh, nine, means something very light or bright. So this is already a digital representation of the image. But for the computer, or for me, or for you, it doesn't really tell us that much. That we have the number two here, or six here, or three, it doesn't carry any really meaningful information. But if we present that same image as a grayscale image and that hits our retina, then some amazing things happen. Already, I mean, when it hits it, we do interpretations, our calculations in our brains can do, find out things like we're outside, this is probably grass, this is stone, this is Stonehenge, there's a book, there's a person. So all of these meaningful interpretations of the images pop out from the calculations in our brains. And that's what we want to do in computer vision. We want to write the computer programs that can do the same thing, that can extract meaningful information from images or from some other data. So that is the topic of today's talk. So I'm going to give lots of examples uh, in these two, two areas. So first, a couple of examples from 3D and 3D uh, imaging and understanding. And this is actually how I got into this research uh, subject. I did my master thesis work in Luleå doing algorithms for autonomous guided vehicles. So these vehicles had a laser sensor that could measure the direction to landmarks on walls. So these landmarks were just like retro-reflective tapes that you put on the walls. Now, as you move, the directions, or sort of the relative angles to the landmarks, they change. Now, if I know where the landmarks are, it's actually relatively straightforward to calculate where the autonomous vehicle is. Vice versa, if you knew exactly how you were driving, it would be relatively easy to figure out where are the landmarks on the walls. But it's an interesting problem to try to figure out both the motion of the vehicle and the position of the landmarks on the walls just by using this sensor data. And that was what I did uh, during my master's thesis. Uh, and the same type of problem pops up in other sensor areas. So for instance, if you take lots and lots of images, but you don't know where they were taken, and you don't know what you're looking at, can you still solve for both of the things? So here's an example of several images of a castle in Örebro. And there are clever algorithms that can automatically find interest points in these images. And there are other clever algorithms that can figure out the correspondence between these interest points in the different images. So the algorithms can find out uh -huh, that this point in this image probably is the same 3D point projection of the same 3D point as that point in the second image. And then there are mathematical algorithms that can take that part and figure out where are all of the interest points in 3D, and how did the camera move when I took all of those images. And then you get a 3D representation uh, of all the interest points, and you get the position localization of all the cameras. So similar to the laser problem, here, these would be the landmarks, and this would be the motion of the autonomous guided vehicle. Uh, and that's the kind of research, research problems that we've been working on for several years. The images, laser sensors, Wi-Fi radio, also for sound. So you can envision the problem that you put out microphones. You don't know where the microphones are, and you just listen. Can you then, just by studying these sound files, figure out how the microphones, where are they located, and figure out where are the sound sources. 
So we made an experiment in the coffee room of the math department. And you could actually do this. And you can figure out that the eight microphones, they were positioned in these green dots. You could calculate that the sound source actually moved along a 3D trajectory that looks like this. But you could also calculate the acoustic mirror of the microphones, and thereby also calculate where's the ceiling, the floor, and, and the walls. And just to sort of visualize this, we took this 3D curve and projected into a video so we can see whether this works out. And you see the 3D curve as calculated from the audio in red. And you can sort of verify that it's reasonably close to where we think the sound source is. And the sound source in this case is a small uh, loudspeaker connected to a mobile phone. So all of these three uh, are examples of problems where we figure out both, sort of, both cameras, 3D mixture, both microphones and sound sources, this kind of chicken and egg uh, problem that we talked about. Uh, and there are lots and lots of applications. I mean, one application is the uh, GPS system, where you have the satellites and you figure out where you are. And a recent uh, application is from a startup from Lund, uh, where this company develops an app for a smartphone that can survey a forest just by sort of swiping your smartphone through the forest. So thereby, you detect all the trees. Where are they? How big are they? What species are the trees, and so forth. So you can sort of survey, you can get, you can digitize the forest and find out all the characteristics of that forest. But there are lots and lots of more examples. And uh, the second topic that I want to talk about is machine learning and recognition. And this is much more closely related to image understanding in terms of categories or, or content, what's, what's in an image. And we've already heard Danitza talk about uh, deep learning. And we have, we'll see that once more here, but with a few more examples as well. So we, when we do the research and we sort of uh, want to um, test our ideas against other research groups, often at conferences, we pose challenges and problems that we want all of the researchers in the world to try to solve. One of those challenges uh, is formulated in the following way. Um, you take a category, say, hammer, and then you collect lots and lots of images containing hammers. So you, contain, you take a 1,000 such images. And then you take a 1,000 images of grapes, a 1,000 images of cucumbers, and then toilet paper, and then cats. And then, so you take a 1,000 categories, so a 1,000 different words, for each word, you have a 1,000 images. So it's a million images. And the game is, can you write an algorithm that, given an image, tells you what it contains? Which one of these 1,000 categories is it? So that's the game. And we saw this in Danitza's slide. The first years, we had an error rate in the, at these competitions of about 30%. It got slightly better. But with the introduction of these deep learning techniques, which are machine learning techniques that we've tried out in the community for a long time, but suddenly they start working out extremely well for these kind of uh, tasks, where basically you push the images. Here it's 106 by 106 by 3, because you have red and green and blue color layers. And then you have a series of computations, which ends up with 1,000 numbers, representing these 1,000 categories. Uh, you have to figure out all of the parameters of this system. So in one of these examples, uh, there are 500 million parameters. So you have to tune all of these parameters so that you get a good results on the images that you have. In the end, you throw in an image, and it will tell you, tell you that it's category 946, bell pepper. And in this case, it was actually uh, the correct one. And we got, after a couple of years, the best systems in the world are actually uh, better than, than humans on this particular task. So that's a kind of thing that we are working more on now uh, in many areas. So for instance, we're using this for medical image analysis. Here we have microscopic images of uh, uh, cells from prostate cancer samples. And the purpose here is to try to automatically 
classify these in terms of benign, so this is sort of okay, and then increasingly uh, levels of cancer. So these are tools, you can train them, you can use deep learning and other tools to give, to give you tools that can help uh, medical doctors uh, find out the right decisions what to do. We're having projects together with the Agricultural University in Olnarp, where they are interested in the interactions of cows. How are they behaving? What are they doing? Are they getting injuries? Can we do something to improve uh, their conditions? So we use deep learning to train algorithms that can find and detect where the cows are and how they move. And we have projects that connect to, say, smart cities, where you want to find out how are the different traffic users interacting, can you make the city safer? Um, and in this project, we're particularly focused on the vulnerable road users, so the bicycles, uh, bicyclists and the pedestrians. But there are lots and lots of other things. You can extract information like where are the free parking spaces, uh, how many are commuting between Lund and Malmö, so lots of statistics that you extract from, from these, these uh, data. Um, so to conclude, the, research, the kind of research that we do is to do right algorithms that can extract this meaningful information. It can be in terms of 3D models. Sometimes it's the models that's interesting. But sometimes the models are just like the maps that we need so we can find the position accurately. So sometimes it's the position of the sensor that's important. And then we have lots and lots of applications where recognizing what's in an image, that's, that's the important uh, thing. And just to wrap up, there are also very interesting problems in terms of understanding what's going on in these deep learned networks. And there are, on a very coarse level, there are some similarities with some structures in the human brain, but it would be interesting to understand better what's happening in the human brain. What are the other parts that we don't understand? Uh, so there are some similarities. We use deep hierarchical structures both in our brains and in our deep learned networks. Would be interesting to do more research on that. So with that, I'd like to conclude, and thank you very much. Thank you, Keller. Um, I'd just like to ask you, you showed these, uh, the, the million uh, situations, the thousand pictures, thousand uh, categories. You said that finally the computers were better than humans. Yeah, on that particular what, task. But what does that mean? Were they faster? Or could humans not tell that it was a bell pepper? No, but uh, many, you know, if you took a random human hmm. and gave them this task, they did, and they did roughly 5% wrong. Oh, okay. Wrong, not just slow, but they no, actually Not just slow, tell. they did it wrong. Because, I mean, on this particular task, someone had curated this database and said that this is bell pepper, it's not onion. Right. And maybe the human said onion, because there was also an onion in the image or something uh, like that. Or maybe there were some species of dogs or that this human actually didn't know mm. what species it is. And mm. So it, it's a very particular task. But for that particular task, the computers are getting better. Right. So that's interesting. OK, it's very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So um, the theme for the next presentation is e-health, more questions than answers. And we'll hear the associate professor in occupational technology at the Department of Design Sciences, also the coordinator of the research platform Health Design. Welcome to Gudbjörg Erlingsdottir. Thank you. I bought my own water. So, there exist many different definitions of e-health, but the best way of explaining what it is, is to refer to it as the digitalization of wellness, health and healthcare. I here refer to e-health in a broad sense, including both public sector services and services and products provided by the private sector. I will start by a brief description of the development in public sector, 
The digitalization of healthcare has been going on for a long time. Ah. Thank you. It's very good to have your supervisor or former supervisor with you. She will <laughs> keep a check. <laughs> so, did you get to see the picture? Um, so, where was I? Yeah. The digitalization in healthcare has been ongoing for a long time now. But when we speak of e-health or the digitalization of healthcare, we usually refer to the more intensified and conscious use of information and communication technology. Such intense use has been noticeable for roughly the past decade or so. In 2004, EU sent out a directive to its member states with the aim to enhance the development of technical solutions for both delivery of services and communication within healthcare. In Sweden, the directive was translated into a national IT strategy launched in 2006. The strategy focused on development of technical solution solutions and stated that harmonization of laws, systems and information content is necessary to pave the way for an enhanced digitalization. The next strategy, the National eHealth Strategy, was published in 2010 and focused on the deployment and evaluation of digital solutions within healthcare. The, law, the latest national strategy document is the Vision of eHealth 2025. It was formulated in March 2016 and says that Sweden will become leading worldwide in the use of eHealth by 2025. And I could also say here that Region Skåne has uh, decided to become best in Sweden. So. Uh, the vision also points at innovations and developments in the private sector as an important part in researching, in reaching this goal. The titles of the dif different strategies documents on the, uh, the titles of the different strategy documents show that e-health is an evolving area. The first refers to IT strategy. In the second, e-health is spelt with a capital H and without a hyphen. And in the last one, e-health is written in low keys with a hyphen, indicating that the term is taken more and more for granted. So, what are the arguments behind these strategies? In essence, what kind of hopes and expectations do central agencies relate to the enhanced digitalization in healthcare? Well, many of the arguments are linked to the area of the informed and empowered patient or citizen who can take active part in his or her healthcare. There are also arguments that are based on the idea that the citizens should have better access to healthcare, amongst others through self-service, and that there is a need for individualized services and enhanced quality and equality. Yet other arguments pivot around the future problems of healthcare. Demographic changes will result in an older population with more chronic illnesses cause, causing a shortage of resources. This made a need of enhanced efficiency very obvious. And then there is the argument saying that the rest of society is becoming increasingly digitalized, but the healthcare is lagging behind in this development. The bottom line here is, however, that the future lack of resources is the main problem 
and that enhanced digitalization is the remedy. How is this supposed to be achieved according to the formulated strategies? They suggest three main steps. Homogenization between digital systems and between the legal system and technical systems. Enhanced information access for patients, professionals and decision makers. Right information at the right time in the right place. And an enhanced pace of innovation. However, in reality, the present organization of public health care in Sweden does not reflect any of these intentions. 20, 21 autonomous county councils and regions deploy different systems and it interpret laws and regulations different, in different ways, making homogenization difficult and development slow. One example is the de development of the service patient access to the electronic health record. The development of the service started in 1997, but it was not put in use until 2012. In the course of its development, the designers encountered several problems resulting, resulting from incompatibility of the system with the existing laws and regulations, but also professional norms. In the private sector, on the other hand, the market is being flooded with apps and gadgets, such as Apple Watch, through which one can monitor both one's training and one's health condition. In the private sector, there are new types of healthcare delivery, like virtual primary care clinics, changing the ways in which healthcare is being delivered. Also, there, there the pace of development and innovation is much faster. This may lead to an immigration of healthcare services from public sector organizations to private companies, which in turn may challenge the Swedish model of equal rights to healthcare. Today, Vitalis, the fair on digital health, has opened in Gothenburg. It has increased with 25% since last year, which is a good indicator of the growing interest in e-health by suppliers and recipients as well. However, there are many aspects unknown as yet, and what is needed is research on all aspects of the impact that e-health may have on healthcare and society. What type of changes in law and regulations are needed to enable the digital shift in healthcare? Will the technical development create digital divides between different groups, depending on age or background? Do new forms of healthcare delivery, like virtual primary care clinics, affect trust between patient and healthcare professionals? Will the enhanced transparency alter power distribution between care providers and recipients? Will it affect patient vulnerability, integrity and patient safe safety? And what impact will all these changes have on the work environment of the healthcare professionals? To obtain sustainable digitalization in healthcare, answers are needed to those and many more questions. This is why more multidisciplinary research on e-health is badly needed. In the network eHealth at LU, or Lund University, that originated from the Pufendorf theme, eHealth for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, 
between 2015 and 2016, we have, up, we have up to now gathered about 20 researchers from Lund University who are interested in e-health. The researchers come from five faculty. They range from practitioners to critical theorists and from are areas uh, like from medicine to law. We hope to be able, by multidisciplinary discussions and cooperation, to answer at least a few of the above listed questions. So that was all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gudjug. Um, you listed uh, a great number of areas in which there might be challenges. Um, could you give us a practical example of something that you think we need to look out for, something that could, some situation that could occur, something that could happen if we don't think carefully about these things without implementing e-health solu solutions? Well, a concrete example uh, coming from our own research is that we now know that uh, physicians, for instance, change their way of writing in health records when they know that the patient or the citizen has a direct access to what they write. All right. In what ways? We don't know that totally yet. We would actually have to, I think, access the... the, the records themselves to be able to an answer that. Um, but what they say is that they write less in the, in the record. They leave out some things that they think might be sensitive for the patient to read hmm. or which might hurt third person. But also that they are um, handling information more directly between you know, between person and person, instead of putting it in the health record. Okay, so they don't which, want it in writing, sort of. They yeah, just do it informally. Which actually might endanger pa patient safety. Mm, absolutely. But there seems to be a variation between different sp uh, specialities. Okay, interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, why not? Thank you. Um, this symposium's, symposium's last presentation is Work and Organization in a Digital Age by the Assistant Professor at the Department of Work, Technology and Social Change at Lund University, also a visiting scholar at Stanford University. Welcome, Kalle Rosengren. Thank you very much, Lisa. <laughs> oh. So, the very last session, the very last speaker. Finally, we're going to talk about work and organization. Isn't that good? Um, so, as we have heard um, during these two days, oh, I can actually, oh, has an image of me. I, that's interesting. Okay, so, yeah. Um, as we have heard during these two days, the rise of digital technologies have had a major impact, both positive and negative, on individual lives as on society. It's obvious that Internet of Things, information and communication technologies, artificial intelligence, and other di digital infrastructures have changed and will continue to change the way we think, live, love, and work. In my speech, uh, I will address how digital technologies are changing the nature of labor and its organizational forms. So. Digital technologies have made new ways of communicating and collaborating possible. And at the same time, it has opened up for flexible work practices. For some, work is no longer bound to a factory, or an office for that matter, but can be performed at home, on the bus, or maybe a cafe. In this sense, work has become freer, as some employees will have more autonomy and discretion over where work is best performed. And at the same time, we can also find evidence that work, in some instances, has become more controlled than ever. 
as the digital technology opens for new potential me methods to track and monitor employee behavior. This development will obviously favor some. Others will find that their professional knowledge maybe have become obsolete. Some will find new opportunities to online freelance job through some of the platforms that Jose van Dijk talked about yesterday, if you remember, uh, like Upwork, for example. Maybe we will all find that in the near future we have fallen victims to technological unemployment. The robots that uh, you talked about, Diana, uh, maybe took all our jobs. So, in my presentation, however, I will focus less on labor market and more on how digital te technologies facilitate and impact work processes as well as organizational design. Or put more simply, how work is performed, monitored and evaluated in everyday working life. The point I want to make is this. As new inventive and ever more ingenious technologies are implemented on workplaces across the globe, many times it's done without prior discussion on policy implication. Sometimes this is just ignored, sometimes it's due to unforeseen consequences of the technology. For example, what is working time in a digital and ever-connected workplace? And what happens to all the data or digital traces that is generated during a working day? My experience as a researcher tells me that it's not always discussed, nor is it clear. A situation that opens up for ambiguities and potentially conflicts on, for example, expectations on availability for work from colleagues, clients and managers. The same goes for the proper use of data and where the borders for personal integrity are drawn. With potential consequences for the health and well-being of the employee and unnecessary cost for the employer. During my speech, I will present some survey data on the topic. This data has been gathered during different research projects and is based on a random sample from the so-called SINT panel, consisting of approximately 400,000 individuals in Sweden, representing the whole of the Swedish population. So, this is a nice picture, right? Um, so you can look at this and, uh, and just absorb what I'm saying. So, One fundamental aspect of ICT is that it makes employees more accessible to others and allows work to become more available to the employee. Access to ICT functions, such as mail, text and voice messages, blurs the relationship between work and private life. Work, in this sense, gets entangled in other spheres, private spheres of your life. One consequence uh, of this is the uh, possibility for employees to continue working after leaving the workplace for the day or maybe not come in to the office at all. Obviously, but maybe less discussed, the reverse move <laughs> movement has also been made increasingly possible. That is, personal and family matters can be tended to during a working day. Tickets can be bought and life puzzles can be solved. All this while trying to conduct regular work. So, as we can see from these numbers in the survey I mentioned, 23% of all employees in Sweden agrees to the statement that I'm expected to be available and answer the cell phone and or email outside office hours. 90% uses internet to conduct their work from home on a daily basis. However, this has not automatically implied that we can spend less time at the office. As you might imagine we use internet to conduct work from home, then we should be able to spend less time at the office. However, this is not the truth. According to the annual report, the Swedes and the internet, Svenskarna och internet, uh, as many as 73% uh, of the respondents state that work using internet from home has not implied that they also can spend less time at the workplace. Also, work conducted outside the workplace is not always valued as highly as being present and seen at the office during working hours. 
as made obvious from this quote from a manager uh, quoted in a, a study from the uh, researcher from U University of California. Um, I'm sure you all can relate to this manager in some sense, or a colleague maybe. Uh, here you go. Um, I think it's easier in some ways to sort of think that somebody's doing their job if they're always there. It's more of a perception, but I think it's easier for a manager to think that somebody's dependable if they, <clears throat> if they see them physically there, especially when they're doing things that aren't immediately visible, like someone who most of their job is sort of creative, uh, and you really can't see that. But if you see them sitting at their desk, then it's easier for a manager to see that that person is dependable. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, from this study, one conclusion was it's, it's more lucrative or you get more um, appreciated from managers being uh, present at the office during working hours than actually performing a good work effort, which is kind of sad. I think you agree with me. Uh, so, consequently, <clears throat> it's important to gain further knowledge on how digital technology uh, interacts with and affects the relationship between work and private life, working conditions and well-being. What we do know from prior research is that limitations to possibilities to psychologically detach from work, to rest and unwind, can cause problems with sleep, and in the long run, stress-related sim symptoms yeah, can be a cause of that. So we also know that as women tend to have the main responsibility for home and family, flexible working arrangements tend to generate greater pressure on women to be available and adjust their working hours around the family's need. Causing a work-family conflict and not seldom feelings of guilt and inadequacy. May be best described in Ulva Elvin Novak's thesis, accompanied by guilt, modern motherhood in Sweden, Mod <clears throat> modern motherhood, the Swedish way. I sällskap med skulden på svenska. Um, so, I think we will maybe cut this. We can discuss uh, how corporations deal with this. Uh, this is my next slide, but I think I will go to the next topic. And another area for concern and further debate relates to employee privacy. What kind of digital inf information is the employer entitled to and how can it be used? In relation to this, we must clarify that we are talking about different kinds of data generated on different digital tools during a working day. And this data contains both information related to work, but also is of private nature. As mentioned earlier, many employees use company digital equipment privately as well as professionally. According to a recently conducted survey I mentioned earlier, all 25% of all employees in Sweden use their employees, employers' equipment to perform personal business on the internet. However, only 21% are aware of what kind of information their employer collects regarding their internet use. Bedat för trubbel. I'm not sure the English translation of that. <laughs> so, yeah. You can, we can talk about that in the pa panel. Uh, so, how interested are companies in their employees' internet use, and how closely do they monitor it? Well, I have not been able to find any reliable statistics concerning Swedish employers. However, according to studies into US companies, reveal that 63% of the companies monitor their employees' internet use. Today, there is also relatively cheap and easy to use software to aid this monitoring, such as Variato 360 and Network Lookout. In relation to this, prior research highlights a number of potentially harmful effects, such as reduced trust in the employer, loss of job satisfaction and motivation when the monitoring is perceived as unjust or too intrusive. We also 
I mentioned we have different kinds of data generated during a workday. We also have another kind of data collected mainly for other purposes, but that none the same could contain privacy sensitive information and be used for close, close monitoring of work performances. I'm talking about digital mobile reporting systems designed to capture and communicate data on workers in the field, such as truckers, security personnel, or home care workers, hemtjänst personnel. I will soon highlight an example into uh, home care services. Um, these digital devices can improve and secure quality of services conducted. They can also improve the safety of field workers by knowing the exact location of the personnel in case of emergencies, such as motor breakdown or a robbery, maybe. At the same time, they present powerful tools to closely monitor every move of the personnel. There is evidence that this kind of data has been used for tighter control of work. In security companies, there are reports of security guards that have been given formal warnings because it was claimed that they had not completed their inspection round as outlined, according to the data. A study on deployment and use of field technology in Norway reveals that in trucking companies, some of the biggest and most important customer customers had blacklisted selected drivers. The reason for this alleged practice was that the biggest customers had access to companies' fleet management systems via the internet, and therefore had direct access to data on individual drivers. This data could inform the customer that some drivers performed worse than others, in other words, spent longer time completing routes or delivering goods than desired. I mentioned Hemtjänsten, home care services, uh, just a second ago. I will go into that deeper now. So, in municipal home care, the possibility to capture and store services conducted by the home care staff has been made possible with a handheld digital devices. In this case, it's the Mobi Pen, uh, developed by Anoto, uh, a Lund uh, company, actually, Lund based company. Uh, today used in over 30 cities in Sweden. This pen registers which personnel has been to a certain customer, for how long, and what kind of services that have been conducted. On entry and departure from the client's home, a barcode on the door is blipped. The home care worker uses a certain mobile pen sheet uh, to note what services have been provided, such as helping with food and medicine and such. And th these activities have to fit into predetermined categories matching the kind of services the client is entitled to, which in care, uh, turn is decided by a care administrator within the municipality management. A process that can help to demonstrate that work has been done in accordance with the service the elderly is entitled to. At the same time, it's a system that leaves little to professional judgment of the home care personnel to decide how to best use their time and resources to tend to the client's needs. So. Fitting the complex needs of an elderly person living at home into predetermined and timed categories could, in this sense, imply a more standardized work process with less control over work, rendering professional judgment obsolete, or as in this case, to an increasing extent influenced by software and predetermined algorithms, reducing decision making to choosing from more or less predetermined categories. There is a saying that goes, what gets measured gets managed. Within the ever-growing possibilities to measure employee performance lies the temptation to break complex jobs down into simple ones, to find one best way to get the job done. Much like the sim time and motion study developed in the direction of establishing standard times for different work processes by Frederick Winslow Taylor at the beginning of the 20th century. Why this development sometimes is referred to as digital Taylorism. Well, as good this was for successful approach to car building by Henry Ford in the uh, 1920s, maybe less so to produce high-quality care for the elderly. Just because something is easy to measure doesn't mean that it necessarily should be measured. Numbers of client visitors, mail sent, phone calls made are maybe easy to measure, but should not be confused with value created for customers and citizens. So, it's my conviction uh, that if the messy components of the social and cultural are not 
included in the technology, unforeseen consequences uh, will arise. So, finally, let the professionals be a part of the design of the tools. Do not leave it to engineers and software designers. And let's have an open debate into how to secure a good balance between work and family. To secure that employees are not objected to over-intrusive monitoring, and how to use the digital technology to enrich jobs and not deplete them of important professional knowledge and judgment. So, one place where you can find this debate is at the Pufendorf Institute, where we, at present, 11 researchers from four faculties are discussing the impact the digital technology have on work and lives. So please join us on this date, uh, uh, and con let's continue the discussion. And uh, finally, uh, if you feel that work is haunting you and that you're having problems to detaching yourself phys psychologically, um, you can use this one. It's from our blog, Skar Go Hem Redan, Going Home Already. So, working free, free zone, print it, stick it uh, on your jacket, nail it to your bedroom door, and uh, thanks for listening. Yes. Thank you very much, Kalle. Since we're running a little short on time, yes. I'll simply ask you to take a seat yes, and perfect. for the rest of the speakers to join you. Oop. Um, can Danita use this microphone? Is that okay? Oh, they prefer you use this one, I think. I'll simply ask the first question, and you guys can start commenting on that while she puts her microphone on. Um, I'd like to hear something before we uh, let the audience ask wherever, whatever they feel like asking. I'd like to hear something from you on um, how successful do you think so far that technology and digital technology designers have been in including other sciences? Because we've talked a bit about this, almost all of you have touched on that and different aspects, um, like that we need to be go across the fields of science, so including like philosophy or ethnology, uh, biology, psychology. How good have uh, tech designers been at including other disciplines and making that part of their work? Uh, any thoughts on this so far? I think it works. Um, yeah, it's so, um, no. I can just give one example. So um, yeah, it's like 20 years ago uh, when the um, Electrolux uh, was in the process of developing um, uh, the first um, uh, autonomous vacuum cleaner. So this was actually um, a, a process where we started to work with the industrial designers from Umeå University. And uh, apart then from looking into the design of the, um, um, the, the, the vacuum cleaner, which I think was a, a very, very nice design, um, was into looking of uh, the design of new homes. And um, Electrolux was very much uh, into the smart homes 20 years back. Uh, and although the ideas were there and the industrial designers were in the process, I think that the whole idea of smart homes was just a little bit too early. So it wasn't ready for the market. So sometimes uh, it's not enough even having the engineers and um, um, the, the designers uh, involved in the process is very much about whether the market is ready. So it's, you, you need even bigger team. Right. Other thoughts on this? Yeah. When it comes to technologies working together with uh, engineers, there are examples. Uh, what my experience from that is that uh, you often need to have a lot of time, set up a lot of time for uh, translation to get to know each other. And I, I think that's perfectly okay because uh, a lot of that com work is, has to do with uh, learning each other's practices. So uh, w when that is done in a good way, I think it's, uh, it works good. Other thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I, think, I think in terms of research, there are lots of examples where you'd have like two or three research groups or disciplines working together on projects, but um, to really stretch across the whole sort of span of society, I think that's, that's difficult. I mean, often you, as a researcher, you start on a very small part of a problem and you probe that very accurately. And then to reach out to other groups, it it's, takes a lot of energy, but it's... Uh, I think it's very interesting, fulfilling. And I think Lund University is uh, 
extremely well positioned to do these kind of works. I mean, since we are so geographically so uh, well connected, so it's easy to go to other disciplines and to other parts of mm. university and society. I think, for example, I know there's a neuro nanotechnology center here in Lund that at least for some time they had a practical philosopher on their team. Um, which I thought was very interesting because it's not, I, I thought it was not so common to see that. Um, we'll open up for questions from you and uh, um, we are going to use this beautiful catch box again. So if you want to ask something, now raise your hands in the air and I'll throw it at you. There you go, Stefan. Thank you. This is my first question from the, from the audience. I'm really happy. I mean, in line with, uh, we've been talking about this kind of cross-disciplinary challenges, and uh, I just have a more like a pragmatic question. How do we reach for or set up environments in the academy where we are able to deal with questions like ethics in robotics or, uh, you know, value, questions of value in terms of big data, stuff like that. That's kind of, you know, between how we traditionally categorize our academy. But, I mean, and we've been working with this symposium as a, as one way to, to make these types of talks even possible. But how could we sustain that, you know, more on a structural level in the, for the future? Um, if, I can, if I can comment on that one. Um, I think um, from one point of view, it's like that we are all... It's a little too close to Nitsa, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I think that um, we have a s uh, significant challenge in doing interdisciplinary research because um, getting financing for interdisciplinary research is not so very easy, okay? So I think that this is one of the biggest problems that the academia is fighting today. Um, because if you, let's say, that, that you would like to study now ethics in robotics, and you have all this discipline, you have the interdisciplinary team, um, it's very difficult to find a financier that would finance this because lots of the calls that we have uh, out there in the, in the um, um, well, from, from like um, SSF, what we know of or something, these are very targeted towards specific areas. So there is, there is very little space for interdisciplinarity. The same thing is like with European Research Council or um, collaborative projects from EU can to some extent um, address this problem. But the, the, the evaluation panels, for example, in ERC, are um, um, really, they, they have big problems with interdisciplinary research. And it's not only for us. I mean, it's also, you know, everything that is like chemistry and physics or um, uh, materials and, and so on. So I think that, um, and I don't know who is to solve this problem. I think that we all in the academia are aware of that um, um, problem. So um, whether the state or the private financiers need to think about and, and just kind of like, you know, um, um, open for this interdisciplinary research, I can't say. But also publishing the results of research like that is not easy either. So I think that for all academics, I mean, it's difficult to dare. You need to be mature in your research and dare to say that for five years I'm going to do something that is good for the society, but I will not be able to publish it. You know, are you willing to do that? Other questions? I, I'd like to make a oh, comment sorry. there. Can I, I, think, I think it might be slightly easier in terms of courses and teaching. So in, in courses you could have a course and you could have a one half, I mean one lecture or something on another topic which crosses across the uh, sort of faculties and borders and stuff like that. And uh, I will get back to you on that. That sounds very promising. <laughs> okay, other questions? We have one right there. Yeah, I have a question to Professor Ostrom because what your presentation made me worried really and truly. My university, which is the University of Gothenburg, bought recently a system either from US or from England at any rate. Uh, it has this usual thing, show that you are not a robot. Now, I can hardly show that I'm not a robot because all the tests are taken either from US and UK. So, for example, there are tests like uh, choose, select pictures that show storefronts. I have no idea what, what are storefronts in the States or something, and I, I protested, but with no results whatsoever. But now what you're telling me is that actually robots will be better in answering this, I'm not a robot. 
Because then I already failed, and, and you know, any of your robots will do it without trouble. So you'll have to get a robot to help you log into your system, which is really very disconcerting. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I could make a comment there. I, I think it's true, and we've had these systems where you first you'd just have an image or some text, and you'd write those texts, but then the OCR system became better and better, so then you made the text wavy, and you'd have the text with extra color. And But the systems for recognizing test sort of text automatically became better and better, so now they moved on to other tasks like doing things in images, and I think that the automatic systems are yeah, or, or better perhaps than, better than better humans than in some of those tasks. So, so maybe this our robot will be even more difficult uh, in the future. I don't know. Yes, can you I? Mentioned that, ah, sorry. You mentioned that you had competitions. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine that this is one of the competition to to beat the <laughs> robot uh, to be yeah the, use these be. tests yeah um, where you have to show that you are not a robot. So. Are you using them as... Um I haven't seen any tests per se that attack that kind of problem, but there might very well be. There are so many you know, challenges in different areas. Yes. We probably have to bring in other dimensions, like the camera or some kind of touchpad, show that you have a fingerprint, then you are not a robot. But then Danica will probably design a robot with a fingerprint, so we might be stuck anyway. Any more questions? Um, while you think about that, um, I'll give you another chance. Um, I'd like to ask you about unwanted effects of technology and of uh, the, the digital things we develop. Because I'm thinking of, um, I once interviewed uh, the Swedish philosophy professor Christian Munt at Gothenburg University. And he talked about um, uh, that we were talk talking about big data. And uh, his opinion was that researchers that develop met methods for use of big data should actually actively work against the methods being used for, for example, surveillance in suppressive states. I asked, is this really reasonable? Like, do you think that, that the researchers should, should have this in mind already while developing? And he was like, absolutely. Just like in uh, during the Second World War, that nuclear scientists needed to think about that they were creating a bomb and what effects would that have. Uh, any researcher could take responsibility for trying to develop a system so that it can be used in the way you want it to. It is difficult to use in, in an unwanted way. Um, I'd love to hear some comments on this. Is this a reasonable idea to begin with? And is it possible, if you think that it's a good idea, is it, is it possible to do that? To kind of, to kind of build in some kind of ethical uh, dimension into the technology or? Yes, to, to bear that in mind as a developer or as a scientist, that not just to go ahead and be focused on that, ooh, this is going to solve a problem in a great way, but actually think about the possible negative consequences and sort of try to take on part of the responsibility for that. Is that unreasonable or is it reasonable? Gudbjörg. Well, I think that um, the more people we, I mean, pull into the process of developing um, technology, we were talking about multidisciplinary uh, groups before, and that's also why we should do that, because the more people that are in the, or the more disciplines that are in the, in the process, the more chance you have to find possible errors or, or other sides of the technology that you haven't thought of, but also that it has to be tested in reality, and that is where many technologies fail, or developers fail. And, I mean, not only us in, at the university, but out in society. You often see, I mean, within the healthcare sector, for example, a lot of technologies are actually developed without them being tested for real, with real uses before they are launched. Why is that? Why does that even happen? Well, one of the reasons my, might be that some of them are aimed at the citizen or the, you know, the patient, which is quite um, anonymous, or it's difficult to have testing person, you know, people to test on from all types of 
citizens. And then you might have one persona or something like that you test the system on, but you don't really test it in reality. I think it's complex, and so that might be one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's extremely important that, that uh, we do think and discuss of these um, things. Uh, but I think it's extremely um, um, difficult because um, when I think about the robotics technology, uh, it's composed of so many different uh, parts. So uh, even if you as an engineer th think about um, an individual part to be safe, and these are put together in a system that also response to kind of like um, uh, human input or something like that is extremely uh, difficult to ensure that something that was, you know, safe uh, as individual module from the beginning is also um, uh, equally safe or cannot be used for something. But in general, I think that all technology can be, can be used for good and bad things. Uh, I think that um, it's important to also educate um, young people from the beginning, what the 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 the, the good use uh, of the technologies are? How do we think about uh, you know ethics and moral? And I think that it's too little uh, discussion about that in society. And there is really not. I mean, in schools, do we teach the ethics and moral? Um, you know, our kids, or do we just kind of like take take it for granted and think that this is kind of like integral part of their upbringing? So. It, it, don't think that we are kind of like uh, doing um, doing enough. But again, the integral part, think about the, the, the um, uh, drugs, I mean the medicine. Um, yeah, maybe every single medicine per se is safe, but combination of those is not. So um, we have already problems like that in other areas. So we don't need to kind of like, you know, think about robotics in future. Already now we have problems and we are not addressing them. Mm -hmm. Right. Kellen? Well, uh, I think that, that the digital technology in specific is in relation to other technologies is so versatile. So I think it's hard to in advance picture unwanted consequences and negative consequences of the technology maybe. However, we need to be much better to detect malfunctions and problems with the technology such as the privacy issue and it's, it's being discussed within the research community. However, it's not discussed among researchers, uh, which was very obvious in, uh, for example, the Puffendorf uh, Digitrust theme. Um, but rather we see the technology researchers over there and the law researchers over there and the medicine researchers over there, and they're not communicating at all with each other. So we, much, we miss, uh, must be m much better at this. And but in relation to privacy, we, we see, for example, advances in areas such as privacy by design. We can talk about Perrin uh, I'm sure you're aware of this. And uh, yes, yeah, so there's maybe hope that it can in somehow be not built in, but we can correct the technology <laughs> afterwards and try to to make it less harmful for, for humans. Uh, but the, to do that, we need to study not only how to develop technologies, but how it's implemented in society as well. Mm -hmm. That's an important field. Mm -hmm. Robert? I think the more, the more general a technology is, the m harder it is to assess sort of the results from the development of or innovation. Uh, we talked about yesterday, about is it good or bad that uh, has internet destroyed this democracy and so on? Um, I guess that that kind of question becomes more and more um, strange. It's, it's, it would be as if saying, uh, did electricity destroy humanity? Or uh, uh, the development of the wheel, was that good or bad? Or, I mean, uh, to some point it becomes um, almost stupid. So, uh, but the more specific technologies, the more important it is uh, to know what are the stakeholders, who, are sort of, who, are, who is fi financing research and so on, what interests are immediately coupled and connected to specific technologies and so on. But the broader a technology is, like a system or a protocol or whatever, it's very hard to say yeah, what would be the results from it. Hmm. You, you, you asked, I mean, your question was about uh, fear, fear or what is kind of like the, the, the result of that we are kind of if the technology is going to do something, what did you ask? If what the technology is going to do something that 
we don't. Oh, want. Uh, yeah, yeah un unwanted effects. Yes, unwanted well, effects, yeah. right? No, but I mean, I'm thinking very much about if we really develop um, robots that take over so many of those manual jobs, and uh, you know, the software and AI take away lots of the kind of the the the, the, the mental job, if I can say it like that. Um, will the again the education uh, uh, follow, and will we be able to really teach our kids to be creative? so that when there are no those like any more manual jobs and so on to be creative enough and imaginary to to find new types of jobs uh, and find new ways of kind of like spending our time so if we don't kind of like work as much as we do but we have more time to be creative do we know how to be creative so that's that's my fear mm -hmm. whether we will find a way of just by default fill up that time with something uh, that is that is valuable if meaningful. robots are doing the work yeah. for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, questions? Still open for that. Yes. Um, back there. Yes. Um, taking into consideration the difficulties that facing the interdisciplinary research, um, I believe that the venture capital can act as a canopy between the different institutions in Sweden to select some business cases, some business models, some new business concepts, filling the gap between the new innovations in robotics, for instance, and the unwanted effects. And then these activities of venture capital can form something, an entity or an incubator, where some sponsors, like corporations like Tetra Pak, uh, Scania, going to sponsor some new ideas based on the researches of a cross-functional team in robotics, in artificial intelligence, in other affairs, in the organization, uh, and in ethical also, then you can finance due to this venture capital as a seed investment in the new, uh, in the new category of research addressing not the unwanted effect, but filling the gap between the innovation and the unwanted effects. Because if, it is, if this gap is not filled by the society through venture capital investment, for instance, it will be filled by others. And they will exploit the, uh, the new innovations in robotics, for example, unethically. What do you think about that as, uh, as a panel? Yes, what do you think about that? Is this a solution? Um, does it have flaws, problems? Uh, there are definitely initiatives um, um, that, that uh, want to bring together the academia, the venture capital, the politics, and uh, the established uh, kind of like both small scale and, and large um, uh, companies. I would say that if the investment is long term, then I think that, that this would be hel helpful. But unfortunately, I mean, for me, long term, five to 10 years, if we embark on something that is highly un interdisciplinary and that we want really uh, the results of that interdisciplinary research to uh, then be, uh, let's say, used by politicians, policy makers, um, uh, by lawyers, if they wanna come up with you know new ways to deal with, with um, uh, the potential upcoming problems and so on. This is not something that you can make in a two-year project. So, um, yeah, the, the, it's good. I mean, whoever wants to invest in this, but it needs to be long-term and it needs to be uh, uh, available uh, to all the players in the, in the, uh, in the society, not mm -hmm. only researchers. I don't think that's, uh, that's enough. Right, thank you. Uh, Stefan, was that a brief question of yours? Uh, if it wasn't so brief, we might want to move on. If you can make it brief, you get it. <laughs> Super. No, it's a conceptual question. Um, uh, I'm very keen on metaphors, and uh, metaphors tends to lift some aspects up and, and, and downplay others, right? And, and when we hear about machine learning, we hear about intelligence, but it's artificial. Uh, it's a lot of concepts that we are also, they are kind of traditionally used before in other sectors, but now it's kind of translated into 
your line of work into robotics. But is that a, do you see any limitations with that, or is there a risk that you don't um, that you don't see stuff that you could develop because of the conceptual framework? Uh, is that that was not a brief question? I'm really because <laughs> <laughs> I mean I've seen that when you translate uh, abstract and uh, complex work and want to regulate it, it's always a hard task because whatever concept you use when you regulate it will be having effects on you know the regulation. But in this term, so yeah, how we understand these complex abstract things you do. I mean, you is teach it the word learning or, you're after, yeah, for example, learning or vision or, a, or, or neural structures, right. you, you know, really brain, brainish, uh, or, or just that is, it is an intelligence, but it's not really intelligence in the sense of the human intelligence. Right. I mean, it's really anthropocentric in a sense. We, we, we understand it as if it was human stuff, but okay. it's not really, is it? Yes, Kelle, and maybe Robert has a word on that here. It also Thank works the other way around, Stefan. Uh, we also bring uh, metaphors from technology to understand us humans. So, uh, for example, in cognitive psychology, we talk a lot about computers. <laughs> with, we have the image of the brain working as a computer with different compartments. We have different kind of information bits. So, uh, so the metaphors goes both both ways. What what it implies for uh, developing uh, technology, I have no idea, but... Right. I was just curious if Robert had a thought on that, since you th you think a lot about the, the interaction between man and machine, so to, so to say, mm. and how do we think about the machine if we think it's intelligent or has vision or whatever mm. it is? I think you, Danica, was talking about that too, about the sort of the idea about the robot as a kind of humanoid uh, and what does... Uh, what does that limit us? Yeah, to some extent it probably does, because uh, a robot can be so much else. You can combine technologies, you, you could, uh, if you want to relate it to living entities, you could relate it, you could um, try to relate it to other kinds of, uh, like pets or whatever, and uh, you also mentioned that we, some, uh, maybe a, a vacuum cleaner, uh, a robot vacuum cleaner related to, um, um, you see it as a kind of uh, almost a, as a pet or a small child. You, uh, so I guess to move away from the idea about something that uh, some replacement of the human, or uh, I think that would open up. And of, but of course, concepts have their path dependency. When you start to think you know, according to a certain concept, that's going to form your uh, thoughts for some while. Right. Um, yeah, I can just shortly say really it's, um, it's a very multidimensional um, question, I would say, and the answer can also be that. But um, throughout the history, we have had um, uh, ways of understanding how certain um, things work in nature, so understanding the, the birds flying and so on, and then building technical systems that somehow understood the physics uh, around it and that not copied the biological kind of solution but built something that, that um, uh, complies to some physical laws and uh, built uh, planes that can fly. I think that I see the technology that we are developing now very much like that. So being inspired by biological systems, using some kind of like laws or something like that, but then building something that is not a copy of a human, that is something else, and then we need to understand and improve uh, through interaction. And it's going to be different from, from uh, what we humans do in the same way as maybe calculator works differently uh, when calculating things and, and as, as our brain does and so on. So I see the technology enhancing the human, but also um, maybe using a little bit more of the brain <laughs> of the human than we do now or using it differently. So for the future, what I see is that we evolve together with the technology in some way. It doesn't need to be direct, you know, um, um, physical interaction or something like that, but more seeing the technology is something that allows us to use um, um, maybe even our brains more effectively than we do today. And it's extremely difficult to say how that will look, and it will take hundreds of years until we understand the difference of the brain today or, you know, and so on. But, um, so, so the technology will um, evolve differently than we humans do, it's just that we need to kind of learn how to use it in the in best possible way. 
Thank you. We need to round off, especially since I know the symposium chair wants to say a couple of words. Uh, so I'd like to give you the same chance as the other panels, but you have to be very short. Uh, this is the thing. You're going to fill in this phrase for me. Uh, I would like to see more research on. So I want to know what you want to do more research on or want to see somebody else do more research on in your field, something that's not yet uh, enough covered. I want to see more research on. What's your answer? Just, I want to see just systems being used by humans and do research on that. Cool, thank you. Good view. I would like to see more um, research on the effects that deployment of e-health has on healthcare practices. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I want to see research about how the ways humans re are embedded in or entangled, not just in technological systems, but also in biological, ecological systems, and how uh, that complexity can be handled and understood. Thank you. Kelle? I want to see more research on how the human brain actually works, and in particular, perhaps the motor cortex and how, the, how it relates to robotics and the perception. Thank you. Kelle? Yes, um, I would like to see some more research into the microdynamics of work-life balance, how people actually manage these kind of everyday entanglements between work and private life. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to have had you here as a panel today. So big thanks to Danica Kragic, Gudjörg Erlingsdotter, Robert Willem, Kalle Wostrom and Kalle Rosengren. Thank you so much.